Hello, my name is Roel Harnish, and I am a cybersecurity researcher from the Cyber Operations and Analysis Technology Group within the Cybersecurity and Information Sciences Division of MIT Lincoln Laboratory. I'm here to talk about a method of traffic characterization that utilizes packet linearity, and this work was funded by the U.S. government, so there has been some minor redacting. This particular version of network traffic characterization was born from the ever-present question I've heard on every operations center floor, how do you know what is normal? And so network baselining became a co-opted term inside of cybersecurity for efforts in understanding what normal is on the network. And after all, baselines are useful if you want to know what is normal, so you have a gold standard to work with. But baselining traditionally comes from the network performance community, where baselines are measured well before anyone actually uses the network, capturing machines, talking to machines. But given an existing network, when a baseline may never have been captured, relative baseline measurements can still be completed. With a relative baseline, you walk in with the assumption that everything is behaving as it should, almost deterministically, and you see what sticks out. Now, of course, assuming everything is normal in order to characterize what is going on in your network has some risks. So if, for instance, an advanced persistent threat is performing operations on your network regularly, you might think that's normal. But the effort is to understand large behaviors of network traffic, not necessarily atomic events. And we stress that a relative baseline isn't meant to be a silver bullet that solves all issues, but rather an analytical approach to understanding potentially anomalous traffic that's on your network. So what can we learn from this relative baselining space? I'd like to go into the exploration activity of uh, one method that we have developed, uh, talk about the implementation and the results of a, that prototype system that I built specifically, talk about some future work on where we, that might be going, um, and then end it with a discussion. So looking at just two features um, that's not normally collected within the classic five tuple, that's the IP source and dest, as well as the port source and dest and the time. Uh, we, we concentrate specifically on the session size, you know, how long or how many packets were in that session or that flow and how much data was transmitted, or the payload size uh, that, that was transferred in that session. Um, and for the purpose of this talk, I define a session to be a unidirectional flow of an arbitrary length. So I'd expect that scanning behaviors would be somewhere in the upper, hand, upper left hand corner, uh, where the payload size is very small to non-existent, but there's a high number of packets, um, and you know downloads or uploads being on the bottom right, maxing out the bytes transmitted within every single packet. And then the rest, or the majority of the everything else, would be somewhere closer to that center line fanning out. To me, this seems like a pretty reasonable hypothesis. Uh, protocols are defined by RFC, after all, and so they have conventions that they follow. Um, and they should be somewhat deterministic in their behavior. And so um, I have this desire that I would like to detect traffic that breaks these conventions, or uh, traffic that might exhibit behaviors that betray what might actually be happening. So let's... Let's see where this goes. This is what the traffic actually looks like. This is a 10 minute interval of flow data coming from the Lincoln Laboratory gateway. And there are obviously are a number of things that might jump out to you. Uh, there are at least to me, the first of which being this, this demarcation line. Um, and that's the minimum bound of packets that you need in order to transmit data. This relates to the MTU or the maximum transmission unit effectively plotting the minimum number of packets that is necessary to convey a, the largest amount of data. So for example, if I wanted to transmit 150,000 bytes in the most efficient way possible, I would need at minimum 100 packets. Just can't transmit that data in less. There's also a bunch of tiny little sessions that are clustered around the origin. Um, and then also the more obvious, these radial clusters that are you know, radiating out from that origin. So let's dive into what those are. You know, as suspected, some protocols and services do have linear behaviors in this space. So hinting that there may be, in fact, some underlying determinism with these protocols, um, as you can see here with FTP, at least, right? And then you could also see it in higher ephemeral ports as well. So there is some merit to this method. Um, how would we begin to classify these behaviors, record them, and maybe incorporate them into a baseline? I have access to lots of metadata throughout our research network operations center. So I have a 
a network operation center that's collecting 100% of the enterprise network traffic that's coming and going from the Lincoln Laboratory. And we've collected about eight years and going of the network flow data from those uh, PCAPs. So I have all of this data and I want to be able to get to a baseline. How do I get there? Um, because there's inherent linear characteristics, why not just start with some linear regression as a classifier and build that at, into a port dictionary? So for the scope of this effort, we focused on just the well-known ports for analysis at first, taking in the network flow records from our data store, pairing them down into unidirectional records that contain only the well-known ports in the source or destination, that is port 0 to 1023. Then we build a port dictionary containing all of the ports and the packets and payloads counts for each of those uh, port numbers. And we feed that into a linear classifier that's using linear regression that's least square means. So then the train test procedure is thus. We pull a minute's worth of traffic. We use one third of that traffic sample to perform linear regression for each port. And we store the best fit line for each one of those ports. And then we offset by 30 seconds, pull another 60 seconds worth, and then we use the session size to predict the port number and then use that as evaluation. So overall, the performance is not great. And that's because the system is agnostically guessing what the port number ought to be given its session size. But if you look at the individual ports, uh, some have scores of 100% accuracy. So some of the protocols are behaving nicely while others can't be predicted this way exactly. But the, the poor scoring has more to do with the fact that it's not very good at guessing given the data that we're feeding it, and less to do with the fact that the individual performance of each port is more deterministic. That's just to say that the system's bad at guessing, but it's actually pretty good at showing predictability. And what I like to do to prove this, that this is a worthwhile endeavor, I'd like to go over four different factors for your consideration. Uh, first of all, do these patterns shift or are they stable? Just how linear are these protocols um, on a spectrum? And what is the potential operational value of this sort of a method? And you know, is this something that's unique just to MIT Lincoln Laboratory? Or is this something that you know, would be viewed across the internet at large? As for the static or variable nature of the clusters, we can address if they drift over time or if they persist with a variability experiment. So instead of recording the results of the linear classification, we recorded the line coefficients per port per minute. That's the slope of the line um, that was describing all the traffic for a given port in a given minute. And we did that for an entire hour, so 60 times. Um, and then we repeated that process 30 times, randomly selecting that hour from th a three month window. So all said and done, every port we had 1800 coefficients, and then we measured the variance and standard deviation for each one of those ports and bin them into a histogram bar chart to get a sense as to whether or not you know, these lines move over time. So here we have the variance and standard deviation for those ports separated into both source and destination. The way you read these charts is that everything to the left uh, has less drift and everything to the right has more drift. And so you can see from the blue bar on the le left of each one of these charts, the majority of lines describing port traffic fall into the first bin, meaning that they have zero drift. Uh, for the sake of transparency, here's the population sizes for all of the ports that didn't fall within that first bucket. And, and you'll notice that there are more well-known ports appearing as the source than they are as the destination, which makes intuitive sense with scanning behaviors and the like. But also for the well-known ports as the destination, there is some, uh, there are some ports that are, that do have drift almost half the time. As you notice, there's 140 in the destination variance uh, in the first bucket and 83 uh, that have some form of drift over time. Uh, otherwise. But nevertheless, even with that drift, the overall scale of the drift is very is less than one. So the ports that are still clustered about the the ports are still clustered about the average. So even if they do drift minimally. So we have a very little drift in this population and it's measurable, it's not very large at all, and that tells me that this is all very predictable behavior. Furthermore, what we see isn't that all the protocols either act linearly or non-linearly, but the exact they exist on some sort of a spectrum. So, you know, on the very far left, LDM is a data transmission protocol used by academic institutions for sharing data amongst research organizations. So, and it's highly linear. 
But you can see traffic like FTP might not want to be linear, and it doesn't quite fit nicely in that box. And in fact, it could be that each individual FTP session follows its own rules, highly linear, but stacked on top of each other for each different flow. While SNTP has some jitter or spread in its structure, but it still falls in some general trend line. So this still tells me that this is helpful for characterization purposes. And if you recall earlier with the prediction accuracy for port 514, it was 44% and 64% for source and destination respectively. Basically, it wasn't very good. But it turns out that the score is affected by the fact that there are two different protocols that are sharing port 514 by RFC, which is hindering the model's ability to classify the traffic. So this finding alone is enough to demonstrate, at least in my mind, that this technique can be used to, as a means to detect network traffic that isn't behaving according to its convention. Effectively, you know, it might betray the fact that it doesn't belong to either one of these clusters, and so thus it might be anomalous. And this behavior isn't limited to MIT Lincoln Laboratory. The clustering and uh, demarcation line is ubiquitous across organizations that we've collected data from, um, whom I've had to redact for this release review process. But we have two different sponsor government organizations that have given us data that both contain the same clusters and the same demarcation line. And that makes it clear that, that this is a candidate for transfer learning tasks, that we can be able to train a model on network data from one organization and deploy that model anywhere else that has operational relevancy. That said, the work has really only just begun. So three things that stand out in my mind as room for more research, which we have only scratched the surface on for this course of uh, over the course of this effort, is that you know, one, the large cluster of traffic that nears, is, that's near the origin needs to be differentiated. Um, there's also um, whether if there's a question as to whether or not this technique can be adequately applied to encrypt traffic. Um, and then there's also an aspect of directionality that deserves attention all of its own. Um, but with regard to the differentiability, 99% of all sessions are less than 100 kilobytes and are below 70 packets in length. So clearly there's a lot of stuff that's there that needs to be uh, sorted through. But one packet, zero kilobyte flows, which are something I call ghost packets, constitute a preponderance of the network traffic, at least upwards to 95% of the network traffic. And you can see that as I filter them out from this drift chart. So in our mind, it, you know, that this is a candidate for further exploration using either deep packet analysis or, or deep packet inspection or looking into the header information for any other further different differentiable features. As for encryption, with more and more traffic going in that route indeed, especially with VPN traffic increasing with workforces working from home, it's important to take at least a passing look at what can be done inside of this space. So here you can see port 443 serves as a proxy of encrypted traffic, and it's you know all over the place with some clustering behaviors, as you can see, uh, while the unencrypted port 80 traffic is mostly at either extreme. But one belief is that the linear process can be conducted again at, with just the encrypted traffic um, and maybe have some success. The idea is that um, if you use the IP address as a differentiator, you, know, you would be able to tell the difference between uh, you know, encrypted UDP traffic from YouTube that would look fundamentally different from, say, encrypted TCP traffic from Gmail. Um, and as for directionality, um, this task has been focused where the work that I've been describing has been focused predominantly on unidirectional flows. And so because of that, the asymmetric nature of you know, server-client conversations become a bit lost in all of that noise. So there was some consideration done with respect to what we're calling directional symmetry, which we wanted to show. Um, and so here you can see a sample of that traffic, of that same traffic, that 10 minute window, but it's been transformed to respect directionality. So each dot is a complete bidirectional flow plotted on a positive and negative axis, depending on where the preponderance of packets and bytes went. So the x-axis is still payload, but now the farther left you go, the more data a client is sending to a server, so uploading, and the more right you go, the more data a server is sending to the client, which is a download. And then on the y-axis, the lower you go, the more packets were being sent from a client to a server, while the higher you are, the more packets a server is sending to a client. So this puts us in a very interesting you know, 
quad chart display uh, with perfectly symmetrical bi-directional flows in the dead center of the graph. Um, ultimately, this area needs a lot more analysis and, and research work done, but uh, we were struck by the emergent structure and the clustering behaviors. To, it was just too much to not put this into the, the presentation. So the question is then, you know, where do we go from here? Uh, this talk aims to advocate for you know all of these types of analysis, this this baselining analysis or relative baselining analysis, not to be the silver bullet, but to give a starting point for analytical efforts in understanding network baselines and what constitutes what a traffic pattern is. Assuming everything is normal at first does incur some risk, but not when you use it as a mere starting point to go down this path in figuring out what is normal. I mean, it's quite healthy to return to that starting point and redefine what you think is normal, knowing that you, knowing previously what you assumed to be true. But more importantly, let let's think of this space as a rich learning technique. Or it's rich for learning techniques um, like machine learning and AI um, for network characterization purposes specifically. Our work will continue building the system to define, you know, or refine what a port dictionary is based off of its, you know, the linear characteristics of the network traffic, as well as going into the, the fundamental questions we went over earlier with encryption, ghost packets, and directionality. Uh, but in this space, in this universe of network traffic, the real goal of this effort is of baselining is to slowly identify the things that are that are real, that we can characterize with certainty and cut them out from the analysis work. So eventually the only thing left is the purely bizarre. So pending any questions, uh, that's all I have. And now we'd like to ra uh, welcome Raul Harnish. Raul, welcome to FlowCon 2021. Thank you. It's glad to be here. So we've got a number of questions coming in from Discord and other uh, platforms like Zoom. So we'll get right to your questions. First one from Jim Raul asking, do you think performance would be better using bi-directional information? Um, it's possible. Um, my first intuition is that... Um, it, I would have to use maybe different uh, methods. Probably not better performance with linear methods, like the linear regression, not like I did. Um, only because um, the, the bidirectional SOT nature of it tends to be very, very asymmetric in the sense of the, the size of data. So like a, you know, when you do a GET request for, uh, for a website traffic, um, the GET is going to be much smaller than the download uh, of the website itself. So um, you're, you're going to have different... Um, you're going to see spread in those two data points. So if you try to average them, it's probably not going to um, work for linear pur for linear purposes specifically. So um, you know, I, directionality is definitely something that I want to look into. It's sort of why I hinted towards that directional asymmetry towards the end, um, but uh, I just haven't tackled it yet. Great. Next, a question from Joe asking: I'm intrigued by these one packet zero byte packets. Are you thinking this might be an instrumentation error? Um, no, I don't, uh, I don't think it is. Um, and because it's demonstrable in the PCAP itself. Um, so, um, you know, our, our, la the lab is, uh, in Lebanon actually has all of this PCAP stored, um, for maybe a three week window. And so, um, while I was going through the iterative phases of prototyping, I did actually pull the PCAP and start looking at things. And so they were legitimately, you know, one packet zero payload, um, flows. Um, they were mostly inbound, obviously, um, like scanning. Um, and so they, they didn't seem to be that interesting just on that level, um, especially from the, you know, the header information. Um, and as I hinted in the talk, it probably would be more worthwhile to do, uh, you know, look into the header, like the flags of the header, um, or, you know, maybe a little bit deeper into the net flow, or not the net flow, sorry, but deeper into the pay cap itself um, to distinguish what's really going on with those. Um, because those could be, um, you know, C2 channels or, you know, some nefarious activity in some sort. Um, but, you know, it's just a lot of traffic. Next question from Discord asking, did you get any insight into the identifiable traffic properties beyond the usual explicit things like header info and port that help distinguish protocols? Um, not, not really. Um, uh, mostly because the the effort was focused 
specifically on, um, you know, using these two features um, uh, of, of bytes and pay, uh, bytes and, and uh, packet count um, specifically. Um, the the majority of the effort, as it was sponsored uh, by, uh, you know, for the government, uh, they really wanted, they were interested in a very specific uh, use case. And so that's where the majority of the work was was headed. So um, I I do want to expand to look at all the different spaces. Um, you know, at the at cursory level, when I did, um, uh, I actually did some uh, uh, principal component analysis on the, dif- the different features just to see what actually might um, be most helpful. At the time, um, it was the complete five tuple plus those two features that I had added. And the, the biggest difference that I could see was, was just the, the bytes and the, the packet count. Um, but... Uh, it's not to say that it was uh, an exhaustive search. Um, um, there, there definitely could still be things out there that I, I missed, and I just haven't uh, had the time to look into it yet. From Matt in Discord asking, is any example code, for example, Splunk or Splunk MLTK, available or published? Um, no. Uh, so the the code that I used specifically. Um, is is not available at the time at the moment. Um, I I do have you know grand thoughts to get it um, published at some point in time, but the or you know open source I should say, um, but um, yeah I mean it's 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 all I've written in Python. It's very simple uh, standard uh, standard code. Um, a majority of the models were implemented using. Um, uh, methods I found in uh, Scikit-Learn, so uh, they're they're nothing special specifically. It was mostly um, doing all of the the glue work, the glue code between uh, you know getting it uh, from our source transformed into a, the right format and then uh, ingested into the models. Okay, next we have for the variability experiment slide. Are you just seeing varying average? Uh, b- bytes and pa- of packets of different message types for a given protocol. Uh, um, if I understand correctly, um, the I'll I'll just go ahead and explain a little bit more of what it was because it is kind of confusing to to say the the variability experiment was uh, you know for every port. So if I would take port zero, I would have thirty hours of traffic on port zero that was randomly selected through that three month window. And it was saved at minute level. So I had 1800 um, measurements of lines that port zero generated. And I had that for all 1024 ports or the well-known ports. And so that's what I used to do the, the standard deviation of variance for, but I only did the variance for each one of the ports. So the standard deviation of variance of port zero, the standard div and and variance for port one, et cetera. Um, and then I bend those based off of, you know, how big that, that standard deviation of variance was. And that's what the results were. I hope that answers it. Thank you for that. And if not, I think that was one from Discord, so we can um, follow up there. I see you're at MIT Lincoln Labs, uh, Raul, and uh, we being at the SCI, another FFRDC. May I ask, what drew you to working in the uh, FFRDC environment, or what drew you to, to Lincoln Labs? Um, it was actually headhunting. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, uh, while I was uh, I was a civil servant for a number of years, um, and uh, there was a, a point in time where you know I was um, you know I was looking at uh, finishing out some of my uh, my degree coursework, um, and uh, opportunistically at the same time MIT happened to be around uh, doing interviews with um, operational folks, um, and um, we, we sort of we sort of worked something out at that point in time. So that's basically sure, terrific. And what's your Flowcon experience? Have you been at Flowcon before or uh, what drew you this year? And we can, we can wrap on that because I'm being told there's a lot of chatter on discord and you okay. may want to head over there, but what, what's your Flowcon experience? Um, yeah, I've only been to one Flowcon before and that was, um, I'll bet way back when I was a civil servant and I can't remember what year it was, but it was definitely, um, it was the one that was in Salt Lake city at the time. Um, and so I, I did attend that one and I, I, I enjoyed the experience. Um, but, um, I ended up coming to this one specifically because, uh, you know, the, the change of my, uh, my roles and, um, you know, more doing more research, um, you know, I had the opportunity to be able to present something that, you know, original work that I had been working on. And I thought, uh, you know, because I had gone to that experience before, I thought this would be the, uh, the perfect avenue. Well, we certainly appreciate you sharing your work and your expertise with us today, and uh, we'll look over for you on, on, on Discord.